uh, Institutogram conversation with me, Sajad Rizvi from the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. Today I'll be in conversation uh, with um, Simon Wolfgang Fuchs, who is at the uh, University of Freiburg uh, in Germany. And I'll just patch him in now. There he is. Um, and just to, to finish uh, the, the introduction on him, uh, Simon uh, recently published a book. Um, hi, Simon. Hello. Uh, hi, Zafat. I, let me just quickly finish my introduction on you first. Uh, so Simon sure. recently published a book called In a Pure Muslim Land, uh, which came out of his dissertation, uh, which uh, is a study basically um, quite a unique in many ways study of um, um, the Shi tradition in Pakistan uh, and of uh, an intellectual history of Shi elites. Uh, and an important element of that book was the impact of the revolution in Iran in 1979 on uh, the uh, Shi communities uh, in Pakistan. Uh, today, um, we'll be talking about um, his current project, which uh, moves, I, I think, beyond that, uh, but is very much still focused on uh, the impact of the revolution. Uh, so welcome, Simon. <laughs> um, sorry, it, it's, it's, uh, today it's, things have worked so smoothly that um, that uh, I didn't have enough time to do the proper introduction first. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, that's good. That's a good sign. Um, I guess um, um, what uh, we'll do, as we often do, is um, I'll ask you to um, maybe say something about why you've come to this new project that you're embarking upon. And maybe if you could say something about how it connects with the work Good afternoon and welcome to today's Exeter Institutogram conversation with me, Sajjad Rizvi from the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. Today I'll be in conversation uh, with um, Simon Wolfgang Fuchs, who is at the uh, University of Freiburg uh, in Germany. And I'll just patch him in now. There he is. Um, and just to, to finish uh, the, the introduction on him, uh, Simon uh, recently published a book. Um, hi, Simon. Hello. Uh, hi, Zafat. I, I, let me just quickly finish my introduction on you first. Uh, so Simon sure. recently published a book called In a Pure Muslim Land, uh, which came out of his dissertation, uh, which uh, is a study basically um, quite a unique in many ways study of um, um, the Shi tradition in Pakistan uh, and of uh, an intellectual history of Shi elites. Uh, and an important element of that book was the impact of the revolution in Iran in 1979 on uh, the uh, Shi communities uh, in Pakistan. Uh, today, um, we'll be talking about uh, his current project, which uh, moves, I, I think, beyond that, uh, but is very much still focused on uh, the impact of the revolution. Uh, so welcome, Simon. <laughs> um, sorry, it, it's, it's, uh, today it's, things have worked so smoothly that, um, that uh, I didn't have enough time to do the proper introduction first. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, that's good. That's a good sign. Um, I guess... Um, um, what uh, we'll do, as we often do, is um, I'll ask you to um, maybe say something about why you've come to this new project that you're embarking upon. And maybe if you could say something about how it connects with the work you've done before, particularly with the book itself, um, which I should have also mentioned was published by the University of North Carolina Press and is available for all good outlets. Um, so do go out and get it. Yes, um, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Sajad, for having me. And thanks for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation. And so I have to confess, originally, I really wanted to do something that is not so much related to my previous work. Because, as you know, one of the dangers of focusing too much on Shi'i Islam is similar to like uh, focusing maybe too much on 
on jihadi thought in our field of Islamic studies, then you're always just put into this she box to a certain extent. And uh, I thought it maybe would be time to maybe build on this work, to build on connections between the Middle East and South Asia, but to do something else. And I originally wanted to do a comparative study on the fate of the Islamic schools of law of the Madhahib in the 20th century in you know India and Pakistan and compare this to the Middle East. And I've already done some work on this, but then as it happens, you know, you go shopping around with your uh, book manuscript and you encounter publishers and they didn't have uh, some ideas what you could do in the future. And it was then uh, that I encountered Fred Appel of Princeton University Press and he suggested, well, um, why don't you write a global history of the Iranian revolution? And at first I thought, well, you know, I really can't get out of the <laughs> of this of this she corner, so to speak. But the more I thought about it, the more I also got excited about this issue because I think when you reflect more deeply mm-hmm. on the revolution, then you realize, of course, there have been studies on its impact, um, but many of these studies have been done in the 1980s, 1990s when there was this concern about Iran exporting you know, its model of government. Yeah. Many of these studies were really driven by geopolitical concerns. Uh, and there was really this urgency of the moment. And I guess at the same time, we have you know, many of these works that are done on Iran are really done from an Iranian perspective, which makes, of course, a lot of sense. You know, people were worried about where their country would be going. There's all this discussion about the rights of women, obviously, you know, the persecution of minorities in, in, in Iran or, you know, how the communist movement was crushed and all of this. But I think beyond, you know, these two approaches, there is still a lot of room to look at this event uh, more from a maybe intellectual angle and to do intellectual history about this. And then I realized, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be primarily a Xi focus because many groups were obviously uh, highly fascinated by these events, you know, not only uh, Islamist or Muslim groups, but also leftists. Fred Halliday at some point has this called the anti-imperialism of fools, you know, that sort of many people were drawn in by what was happening in Iran and later maybe disavowed it. But and of course, you could say, you know, why? What's the point of studying uh, an event that later, or you know, people distance themselves from it? But I think recovering this, on the one hand, this moment of the early 1980s, why this was attractive to so many different people, but then at the same time, not uh, just stopping there, but also extending it and maybe thinking about some of the more long-term implications and trying to bridge this gap. Um, this was what really fascinated me. And then I thought, okay, you know, maybe the the Madhahib will still be there. <laughs> and yeah, eventually I will, I will get back to them. But in the meantime, I'm really fascinated also in tackling this. But but also, I mean, in many ways they're connected because, um, you know, what's happened to um, sort of Shi Islam as a legal theological tradition has been impacted by the revolution. Um, and and of course, you could easily compare what's happened in Pakistan with other places. I mean, you know, a lot of people know that in Pakistan, the um, uh, we, we no longer are in a position where everyone, people basically who run the centers, the Shia centers, etc., are not the old Najaf trained guys. But in many cases, they're people who studied in Iran after the revolution. So that's really changed uh, on the ground level so much of what's going on um and you could you could very much uh, uh compare that with other contexts and and i think you're right i mean you know the the early studies you can think of you know the social protest volume the famous mm. you know volume the the third world quality articles in the late 80s you know they were all very much i guess political scientists or sociologists trying to make sense of it and and you know maybe it is um yes it's time for the um, the intellectual historians to get back into this <laughs> uh, yeah but you're right of course i mean there is i mean pakistan was my initial initial encounter with all of this mm-hmm. and i think one of the, you know some of the pamphlets and uh, publications that i 
collected for my previous uh, research also already drew me, I guess, to this, or, you know, to this next step. I remember there was one pamphlet that I also encountered, which basically argues this is from the early 2000s, that basically Maududi and Khomeini are two brothers. So they are all pursuing the same sort of evil interpretation of Islam because it's sort of an Islamist interpretation. This came out more of a Diobandi uh, perspective and they were trying to link uh, you know, these two approaches. And of course it was mostly an, an, an intra-Sunni conversation. And if you want to smear your opponent, then you accuse him basically of Shi proclivity. So this was definitely one thing. But then I guess also, as you said, uh, this was another thing that I also in my previous project and also now I was not really satisfied with the existing literature to try to make sense of the impact of this event on Pakistan, both on the Shi side, because there it was often then really just seen as people wanted to to argue, you know, certain Shi groups such as tools of the Iranians or the other way around, or there's really not an interest in the revolution because Shis are only interested in esoteric or, you know, outlandish rituals they are doing in Pakistan, so they are not really interested in these transnational connections. But then also on the Sunni side, I think it was sort of similar when you, that sort of, there was just, you know, sectarianism was used as a catchphrase, so somehow the, the geopolitical constellations after 79 have led to sectarianism because suddenly Saudi money was available and then, of course, you know, in Pakistan, sectarian actors would arise without paying any attention to, you know, what they were actually saying and how sort of the local concerns they had. Yeah. And, and I guess um, also, I mean, as I'm sure you'll be looking at, there's, there's kind of a, a way in which we might try and, and divide, um, you know, the, the impact into different phases as well. So, you know, the 1980s was a very different time to what we have now, um, you know, now, especially post-Iraq 2003, post-Arab um, Spring, Syria, Bahrain 2011, um, you know, the wider context in, in, in South Asia of what's been happening with politics in India and Pakistan. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very different world. Um, and so in some ways, if you're still trying to make sense of what the impact is now um, of the revolution, it's probably much more nuanced and variegated than it ever has been before. Sure, uh, I would totally agree, but it also makes it much you know, trickier to trace what has been happening and how, how we can make sense of the impact. Just to tell you sort of one story I feel that, you know, which captures this quite nicely. I uh, had some contacts in Pakistan, they put me in contact with uh, leading uh, sort of functionaries of the Jama'at Islami uh, in, in India, that yeah. in the early 1980s was also quite excited of about what was happening in in uh, Iran, even though they are a Sunni Islamist group. And I wasn't, I have to confess, I wasn't really prepared for this meeting because they didn't tell me any details. I thought this would just be on a one-on-one a -on -one conversation. So I had asked some questions in Pakistan. This was all quite frank and open, and we could discuss how you know the group had maybe also changed and their perception in Pakistan, but in India, I really stumbled into this meeting and I had no idea whom I would be meeting. Then I was asking my same questions and it was simply silence, you know, there was really no, so then at some point, some, some of the people present there said, you know, like we are an exclusively Indian group, we have no uh, like thoughts on Iran or any other Muslim country. We are not interested in, in the international Muslim scene. So you can, you're welcome to ask us about our local charitable activities, but there's nothing else to discuss. And of yeah. course, you know, this makes, if you're in, if you're an Indian Muslim in, in the year 2019, it was, then of course, you know, this makes sense. But if you would then only rely on these interviews and the, today's perception, this would of course, also not really capture what was happening uh, 30 years ago. And so this makes it also tricky then sometimes. Yeah. No, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, especially with the, the current uh, context of a government, which uh, basically uh, presents uh, Muslims as, as foreigners. You know, either you're a foreigner or if you want to uh, stay here, you have to um, acculturate right. in some way. Um, uh, can I then maybe ask you to say a bit more about 
what is the project that you're trying to put together? I mean, uh, what, what does this global history of the revolution mean? Um, you know, what, what sort of things are you thinking of, of looking at? And, um, and maybe right. you could be, you know, pulling in lots of people into like a huge project, um, you know, preferably ERC funded or something like that, um, which, would, uh, which would work in terms of the, the variety of questions you might ask. But anyway, what, what sort of questions are you asking? What, what, do, what is the scope? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for this question, Sajad. You know, of course, I should state from the outset that to a certain extent, I mean, I would love to do this on a more collaborative basis, and hopefully there will be room for this in the future, because, of course, you know, as an individual human being doing this on a global level and doing justice to all these different actors is tricky. But uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I have set out now to write a monograph, and hopefully it will succeed. And I'm interested in, in a couple of things, actually. So on the one hand, I think it's also necessary to um, put some nuts and bolts in, in place, uh, also to get a better sense of what was actually happening when we talk about Iranian outreach, or also Iranian efforts to get the message of the revolution across. And when you look at the literature, there is one shadowy office of, you know, the Office for Liberation Movements, for example, that was then run by the Revolutionary Guards that existed until sort of the later 1980s. But for example, we don't really know much about the activities also of this office since, you know, a lot of the stuff was really secretive, um, obviously, since it was sensitive to be in touch with certain liberation movements. But also during research in Iran, I could gather some, you know, internal documents that I can't talk about now in, in a more detailed fashion, but I think which also gives us a better sense of which delegations were sent out, who was then responsive to invitations um, to Tehran. But even beyond sort of these more spectacular sort of efforts, I think it, it also makes a lot of sense to trace conferences, to see who was there, to trace speeches that were given and, you know, not only, of course, the Iranian perspective that, that comes up in uh, publications in Persian, but also Arabic, Urdu, Turkish, English, Arab, you know, all sorts of languages, but also to flip it around a little bit and to look at travelogues, for example, of people yeah. who were there, who attended, uh, you know, anniversaries of the revolution, 1980, 1981, later during the 1980s, and to listen uh, to them, what they had to say, how they perceived uh, arriving in Iran, being part of this propaganda machine, because then, of course, you get a a very different take of what they saw of this. And the Iranians always made sure to invite um, Sunni delegations as well. So I remember, for example, in, during my research, there's one Lebanese scholar, Faisal Maulawi, who was really incensed that he, you know, he was part of a Lebanese delegation uh, going to Iran in 1981. And then later in the Lebanese press, he read about that this was only a Shi delegation that uh, he was part of. And he was really furious and said, no, this was, you know, much more than this. And uh, so to look at these sort of internal documents is, is definitely one aspect. So to yeah. get a little bit a sense of the nuts and bolts, so to speak. But then, you know, I'm also interested in expanding this to, you know, Sunni movements uh, more generally to, to also trace how they were discussing Iran later throughout the 1980s into the 1990s and of course today as you said you know things have shifted and there has been movement I think another uh, aspect that I'm very curious about is to take a closer look at female activists also in an Iranian setting since when you once again when you look at um, Sunni Islamist groups in the early 1980s when they wanted to illustrate how a proper Islamic society looks like, they often used in illustrations and photographs from Iran, since, you know, gender and sexuality is so important. And um, often, then, of course, uh, you know, Iranian female activists, they played a role, they went to UN meetings, they went around the globe, they attended uh, conferences, they went on journeys, they, you know, also female activists were invited to Tehran and other places. And I, I, once again, I feel this is an aspect that hasn't really been looked at from a more transnational or global angle since so much of, these, of the great scholarship we have on the question of gender and sexuality in Iran is really very much focused on this internal struggle and how to yeah. you know, fight back against some of the regulations after the revolution. Um, 
And then I think beyond this, I'm also interested in, uh, you know, maybe also getting a sense uh, of the reform initiatives in the 1990s when Iranian thinkers were also trying to reconcile Islamic law, Shiism with yeah. democracy. And once again, this is so far very much an internal Iranian story. And I also would like to know more to what extent we can also say that, you know, these the study of this of these ideas had an impact beyond sort of the Western Academy, where of course uh, Soroush and Shabestari and other people have really received attention. But can we also say that within other parts of the Muslim world, sort of their reworking of the of the Islamic tradition or you know of democracy and this sort of stuff, whether there are also, there's also an impact uh, there. And of course, maybe as a last point. I think it would also be interesting to see whether we can actually really trace some long-term shifts in modern Islamic thought that is tied to the Iranian revolution. So once again, I would probably say, or even, you know, so, I mean, this, is, this becomes really tricky because I guess many of these shifts, people would not really attribute this to Iran, you know, given the current climate. And so that's definitely a challenge to maybe to make a case for the importance of the ulama today to what extent has this um, to do with uh, with Iran? Of course, you know there are some more prominent examples when you look at someone like Yusuf Al Karadawi. I think he has really expressed his admiration for the Marjaiya and to what extent you know Shi'is have a system in place like this, and to what extent he was then trying to replicate this for a Sunni audience as well. So these are some of the ideas or aspects that I would like to consider in this project. I mean, that also raises this rather interesting question of of what like constitutes the Iranian model. So, uh, you know, to a certain extent, you could say this developed. So you have an early conception of, you know, a state which has this kind of figure at the top who is basically a cleric and mm. the idea of, of clerics being uh, within the executive uh, branch of, of the government. Uh, but then also how that then becomes complicated when you have, you have things like reformism. So, you know, of course, since reformism was not about rejecting the Islamic Republic, uh, but right. about, you know, I guess, tweaking it, perhaps you could say. Um, mm. Then then when that, the ideas of reform are disseminated, for example, Lebanon, I think is probably the place I can think of where there's the greatest impact of the um, the reformist mm. discourse of people like Surush and Shabbat Sadi, etc. Um, the, uh, the basic idea that the Iranian model holds, you know, and has a stable significance uh, is not questioned. It's basically how you implement it and make sense of it. Right. It starts happening. And I wonder to what extent that works in other cases. Someone also mentioned, you know, to what extent does the do the internal, perhaps mm. um, clerical debates in places like Qom over, for example, Velayat Afaqi, how do they then play out in other places um, when people are kind of, in a sense, receiving what the significance of 79 is? Right. I mean, you know, to answer this question, so to a certain extent, I could answer this in the case of Pakistan, since I have sort of tried to make sense of these these debates there, and I will touch upon this in a second. But I think in general, that's also an excellent question that I think we also need, even for a movement like Hezbollah, I think, you know, they how they make sense of all of this has really been discussed in a rather reductionist way, I feel. Yeah. So often it's really just, you know, people wanted to see, are they you know, just a figurehead for Iran, do they have any agency on their own? And, you know, of course, I totally understand that these concerns are important, but to look at the internal debates there, what this means for a context like Lebanon, maybe there is also some, you know, maybe you could dig a little bit deeper in this regard. And for Pakistan, I mean, it's obvious that, I mean, there it's really interesting that in the early 1980s, no one wanted to touch Vilayat e Fari because it was such a, toxic uh, topic and uh, even we could say to a certain extent the 1980s were the height of Shi activism in Pakistan but um, you know activists didn't really want to be seen as Iranian puppets at the time and this hints back to what you said earlier only now that we have a, a distance of 40 years to the to the events of the revolution sort of we have voices that really embrace this concept and say this is precisely what we have to do of the for Pakistani setting, even though we are a minority uh, community, but um, to embrace 
Belaya is really what we should do and all other political activism is useless. Just claiming protection for our possessions doesn't really get us anywhere. But it really took a long time, you know? And so I guess that's sometimes a little bit the, um, maybe what you wouldn't expect that some of these ideas uh, have an impact so much later after the fact, so to speak, and not immediately in the year 1980, 1981, when a lot of the analysis have stopped and say, you know, until now we have not really any significant impact. And so this means the revolution or this entire project has failed. So yeah. And I mean, especially with this, with respect to someone like um, Khamenei, I mean, I think it's partly because you have generations of people who have grown up who don't remember the kind of that sort of transitional phase just after Khomeini, when it mm -hmm. really wasn't clear what was going on and, mm -hmm. You know, he was a lot less secure, perhaps, as the defender of the revolution, as he might be now. Um, so much so that you'll, you'll have people who, you know, I, I, to give you one small anecdote, I, I had a conversation a few years ago with someone who works for the World Bank in D.C., who basically said that the only way you can deal with the problem of violence against the Shia in Pakistan is for all the Shia to accept Khamenei as the Valley of Faqih, which struck me as being kind of a, a strange position to take. Um, but it, what it showed you is that this chap was much younger, so he doesn't remember what was mm. going on in the 80s and the early 90s. So he has, right. no, he has no memory of that sort of contestation and, and no memory internal, of the internal fights which were going on as well on that sort of issue. So I think that's interesting. I mean, there's a generational aspect there as well. Um, no, too. totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of uh, some of the themes which you think, uh, you know, because, you know, even when we talk about exporting the revolution or looking at the global mm -hmm. impact, um, what sort of things are we really looking at? You know, if you sort of break it down, um, are you looking at kind of third worldist anti-imperial mm -hmm you know, fight the power, uh, fight the empire, talk, you know, strike back at the empire kind of thing? Are we talking about, um, you know, workable Islamism? Um, are we uh, talking about, um, you know, kind of new ways of organizing societies in, in less institutionalized manners? I mean, what, what sort of things do you think were appealing? Like, you know, for example, if you take some of these uh, communities, uh, in West Africa or in South America, what do you think was was getting them interested in, in the revolution and, and, and embracing mm -hmm. the ideas of the revolution? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question, Zajad. And I think, you know, once again, in, in this context, we really need to get beyond sort of the usual tropes that it was all about anti-imperialism, which of course I think played a huge role for many groups. But once again, that the local context is really decisive. And mm -hmm. just to give you two examples, when we compare, for example, Islamists, like Sunni Islamists in Lebanon and the Jamaat -e Islami in Pakistan, then it also becomes obvious that they had very different concerns. So the Jamaat -e Islami in Pakistan, the Sunni Islamists, they saw the revolution really as a manifestation of something they had been striving for for a long period of time. They really saw that what the Iranians were doing is putting Hakimiya, sort of, you know, the divine sovereignty that uh, Maududi had written about into practice. So this is how they framed it and this is what they appreciated and they saw themselves as really working toward the same goal. When you, at the, on the other hand, look, for example, at, at Sunni Islamists in Lebanon, what they realized, it, they had much more of a concern of the com competition between sort of leftist and Islamist forces. And they figured why the, one of the reasons why the revolution has, had succeeded in Iran is what that, you know, the clerics had managed to build an alliance with the common people. So they had, they had sounded the slogan of, you know, that they, that this was a revolution for the downtrodden and you really took this seriously. And this led to uh, really an introspection within sort of the, the Islamist camp in Lebanon that they realized, you know, we are mostly of middle class background. You know, if we are honest about all of this, we have no idea how many factories and workshops there are in Lebanon. We don't even know how to reach out to these people and how they live, you know, so we have no idea. So how can we really claim the mantle of the revolution if we don't manage to build 
the same alliances. And if we don't do this, then um, the you know leftist forces will you know basically cash in on all of this. And I think it, this also shows you know in, in, for them it really led to a rethinking of their approach towards social justice, what they saw as sort of the hallmark theme of the Iranian Revolution. I think maybe other other uh, groups like in in Egypt or other places for them it was really the challenge to come up with you know a proper a proper Islamic constitution because they had been accused for a long period of time that Islam is the solution is not enough. They have to find a workable, um, you know, way to delineate an Islamic state. And it's fascinating that from the mid 1980s, we suddenly have uh, an, an abundance of Islamic constitutions that are published in a place like Egypt. And where does this come from? Why is this suddenly so important that uh, you sit down to devise a state, you know, with all its different uh, organs and uh, institutions? And I think, you know, for here also the Iranian revolution and the model it provided uh, played a huge role. But so to a certain extent, there are these overarching themes, but then the local manifestations, I think, also differ uh, differ very much. And since you asked me about South America and other places, um, you know, I guess here, uh, this will also be a challenge to explore for me in, in the future. It would also be interesting whether some of these groups then really take over any of the Iranian language. You know, someone like uh, Julia Lovell in her book on Maoism, A Global History, she has really managed to show quite convincingly that groups from Peru to India to Nepal, they were all familiar with Mao's works and in their writings you feel all his formants on, you know, political power comes out of the barrel of a gun or the guerrilla have to move among the people like fish in the water. Mm. And I wonder to what extent, I mean, the translation of the Iranian revolution, whether this was also possible beyond mere slogans of, you know, third worldism or that now yeah. their support or did they provide support for liberation movements? I'm not entirely sure at this stage to what, ex I mean, this will be really a challenge, I guess, yeah. also to flesh this out in sort of a non-Muslim context to really say something so, more yeah. substantial, I guess. Um, by the way, if people have questions and comments, do, do, do bring yeah. them forth and we'll try and deal with them. Um, on this question of, um, of the material, so, I mean, what sort of archive do we have uh, in terms of, you know, the sort of, let's, let's look at it in, sort of terms of what the the Iranians were putting out. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, um, I assume that they were producing materials in different languages uh, and targeting different. I mean, what sort of archive do we have of that material? Is it is this something where you really have to struggle to find material? Um, is it, for example, easily available in, in one place in Tehran where you can just access, you know, I, I know the, the revolution, there's like a, an organization for the documents of the revolution, if I remember correctly. Um, how accessible has that been for you? Have you managed to uh, uh, to, to gain access to it? Uh, what, what sort of archive is there for the sort of material that you want to be looking at? Yeah, right. I mean, a great question. So the um, Center for the Revolutionary Archives in Tehran, I mean, has two parts. So on the one hand, they have a library with, you know, pamphlets they put out, uh, some, not so many journals, unfortunately, but uh, it's more, you know, books, pa uh, pamphlets, as I said, and that's really accessible. So this was really not a problem. Then, unfortunately, the sort of documents they also have of, um, which I guess could also be really interesting, at least when I was there in September, they said, you know, this part you can go through sort of our search mask uh, in our internal computer system, but you can't request sort of this material. That's not for foreigners to see. Well, fair enough. But then the National Library in, in Tehran is really well um, well stacked with uh, journals in different languages that, I, that I'm really relying on, periodicals, but also internal documents, uh, you know, sort of that are now uh, open, that are no longer classified or, you know, sort of, you know, that are accessible. So this has been really helpful. But I think also moving beyond sort of the Iranian uh, aspect, for me, it's really important to look at publication that come then out from Tunisia, from Lebanon, from 
Kuwait. I think Kuwait is also interesting in this regard, especially when you for the study of uh, more Sunni Islamists, since we really faced the issue in the 1980s in particular, after the assassination of Anwar al-Sadat, there's in the entire region really a clamp down on material that is put out by, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and its various branches. Mm -hmm. And Kuwait has always been different since there, there was more liberty to publish material. So, and yeah. when you look at the early 1980s before it, sort of the clampdown occurs, many of these journals, be they, you know, published from Lebanon, from Egypt, from Tunisia, they all share materials. And uh, so they share articles, it's published in, in Adawa in Egypt, and then it, it shows up in Al Marifa in Tunisia. And so this shows, all, you know, some aspects of this Islamist international, even though it was never really possible for the Muslim brother to create sort of a worldwide network. Uh, and, but this also means that, of course, people in Kuwait, for example, are very much plugged into all of this. And even though they have their own concerns, this can help us to fill in some of the gaps. And Pakistan is, I mean, also helpful in this regard, since I think they, compared to many other authoritarian states, despite uh, it being a military dictatorship in the 1980s, a lot of stuff could be published. Mm. And uh, this uh, also gives us many information about people going back and forth. You know, they did a lot of translations also, for example, from other works that are no longer accessible. So I think if you piece it together from various countries, then you can get a good sense of who was going where and what people actually said about uh, all these sort of issues. Yeah, I mean, there's, well, there's lots of questions coming in about, or comments about um, how the current situation is much more sectarianized. So, you know, the, uh, the possibilities of, for example, you know, different branches of the Ikhwan or different local Ikhwans around the world having this sort of relationship with the Iranian government nowadays is perhaps a bit more problematic uh, than mm -hmm. it has been in the past. There, there's one element which I think feeds into that sectarianism, which I want to also ask you about, which is um, it certainly okay. seems that um, from 79, um, at times there was a conflation and a deliberate kind of um, confusion between uh, the promotion of certain, um, I guess, political ideological positions and the propagation mm. of Shiism, right? Mm. So, you know, quite often the, the material that would be produced uh, by the propagation, um, which was, was very much uh, government-led um, in, in Iran, um, was in the end not so much about theology, but was actually about promoting a certain model of society right. and, and governance, which was was of course the the the, the revolution. And and I think that continues. So even uh, where you do have, um, uh, for example, uh, Shi communities around the world, which may have originally uh, heard about Shiism from the revolution. Uh, they've now become communities which are much more engaged in, in theology and perhaps a bit more introspective and less politically mm -hmm. active now than they were before. But because in the early period, the promotion of politics and religion were so closely intertwined, it was very difficult to separate out, you know, what was a simple kind of missionary effort in terms of, of spreading the faith and um, mm -hmm spread ideology uh, and I, I wonder you know to what extent that really works across the board you know across mm. the world um, or is that very specific to certain places like I mean Pakistan and Lebanon are the most obvious ones um, but I, I wonder across the board um, you know how that relationship between the promotion of a certain faith uh, works alongside mm. the promotion of an ideology yeah I'm, I'm not sure whether I have a good answer for you in this regard, Zajad. I mean, it's, a, it's also a great question. I think, though, what it, I guess, you know, once again, the Iranian material, um, as you said, I mean, has uh, certain limitations insofar as only certain aspects are propagated, but I guess it can then help us to identify a certain people who had strong relations with Iran and then maybe go back to sort of their writings or their publications elsewhere, their statements elsewhere, to try to parcel out uh, how this, you know, is reflected in their other writings and not to rely only 
on the Iranian material in this regard. I guess this is also uh, really, uh, really important uh, to in order to to flesh this out. But otherwise, I would totally agree with you that um, I mean this. So that's maybe also something or a danger that I could potentially run into to reduce debates on Shiism in this time period, mostly to a political context. Um, but uh, I guess if one is aware of this and you know, not to fall into the trap of only relying on Iranian publications, then one could potentially also work around this. But, um, you know, to relate to an earlier question that has been asked about to what extent today maybe Ikhwan-related groups could relate to Iran at all, I think um, in this context, I mean, I was once again recently struck by some research I've been doing on, on, on Pakistan in this regard that we can really see that the jamaat e islami was until the mid-1980s very open toward um, Iran and then it for several reasons it doesn't pronounce its allegiances or its indebtedness to Iranian thought openly to the extent that in 1989 when they hold sort of a big um, uh, seminar in Lahore on the future of the Islamic movement where everyone is there so Erbakan, uh, Ranushi, you know, important Egyptian representatives people from Jordan, you know, all across the board, there's no Iranian representative left. But then last year, uh, for the 40th anniversary of the Iranian revolution, Liaqat Baluch, who is currently the general secretary and was a student activist in the 1970s, um, he has also met Khomeini three times. So he went, uh, he attended a, a live streamed um, event in Lahore, uh, where he then also basically said that Iran is the only existing uh, Islamic state, you know. So, I mean, maybe for some groups being removed also from the events also opens up once again that they can be more open about this. I'm not entirely sure. So I was also puzzled, how shall we make sense of this silence in between? You know, there's this initial fascination, then there is silence. But you realize you know, these connections have never been, been totally broken. So how to conceptualize this, that's also an interesting aspect, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I know you're, you're going to be focusing uh, much more on themes, but um, uh, <laughs> in, in terms of your, um, your coverage, are you going to be looking at, uh, at Europe and North America at all? Um, I, I mean, yeah. of course, we know, we know quite a lot about uh, the reception of the revolution in Britain. Uh, right. of the, um, you know, in terms of student activists, in terms of right. the Islamic Foundation, in terms of the Muslim Institute, etc. Sure. Um, yeah. I assume this must have been across the board and, and uh, you know, um, in, in different European states and certainly North America as well. I mean, that, that seems to be quite an important element of it. Um, yeah, so I recently came across um, this issue with sort of the, the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood also had an important center in, in Germany. At the, there's a big technical university in the city of Aachen, and they had an influential Islamic center there. And uh, they have also been frequent guests, you know, at the at events related to the Iranian revolution, even at a time when within Syria, there was already, um, you know, the basically the regime with Iranian blessing was really... Uh, clamping down quite heavily on the Muslim Brotherhood. So you're right that there are all these connections. So for the book itself, I think the um, the idea was more for also from the publisher that the European angle uh, has been covered to more you know to more extent than other angles. I guess what they meant was more that we know about Foucault's support for the yeah. revolution and European intellectuals who were fascinated by all of this and then later distanced themselves from Iran. So mm. I think in my research, more and more of these European connections also come to light, maybe also because in the 1980s and, you know, Europe was also then an opportunity for many of these activists to speak more freely about these issues. So I'm still not entirely sure it's there and it crops up all the time. Um, and also for, for translation purposes, of course, I think Europe, Kalim Siddiqui in the UK and sort of his, you know, how he made the message then accessible to 
the Muslim diaspora in North America and all of this. So I think it can't be ignored. It's really essential and really important. So um, yeah. I think I have to find some ways to re-include it, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. There's also this uh, comment from someone about the impact of the um, of this uh, international seminary students in Qom after the mm -hmm. revolution and kind of disseminating. I mean, this is something, of course, that you've discussed in your your work on on Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. of course, it, it goes it goes far beyond that. I mean, it's it's an element of what's. For example, Southeast Asia is a good example of that, where um, you know those who have been trained in, in in Qom have then gone back to Thailand, to to right. Indonesia, to Malaysia, and that's become very much part of this uh, question of um, of what's going on there. It also it also begs the rather interesting issue of um, uh, why local context is important. You know, why is mm -hmm. it that um, perhaps support for the revolution or the idea of Iran as a model? Um, is easier to engage with in places like Thailand and Indonesia, mm -hmm. but not in Malaysia, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and that's still an ongoing issue of, of what the local mm -hmm. circumstances are which, which distinguish them. Yeah, no, totally. No, but you, you're right, I guess, for, you know, to get a better sense of, of these contexts, um, I will have to rely on some excellent observations by colleagues in this regard, since, you know, once again, not every... Uh, local context can be uh, can be covered to the same extent but um and also I in the current circumstances you won't be able to travel there that's <laughs> so, right that's you know, true. who knows when when uh, you know not traveling for research is going to return I mean, we don't know. that's right good point <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah because i mean on the face of it you think this is a great project you go to get to go to southeast asia you get to go to south that's america right. you know this, this right. sounds like a, a great, great uh, opportunity to travel the world. But, right. uh, alas, yeah. <laughs> can I can I bring you on on to back to one very specific thing because of course you mentioned mm -hmm. it before with respect to the Jamaat -e Islami in Pakistan. You know, holding up um, uh, Iran as a model for how divine sovereignty can be effected in a republic. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if we could connect that to um, <clears throat> to Andrew March's new recent book, The Caliphate of Man. Mm. And um, if you have any thoughts on on um, you know how how that kind of relationship between divine and human sovereignty is negotiated, and particularly within the Shi context of Iran, if you can say something about that. Mm. Um, and then, to what extent is that then the model that people would like to? Uh, pursue as opposed to maybe Rashid, Rashid al Nushi, who I think he is more interested in mm. that. Yeah. Well, when when I when I was reading the book, so one question that came to mind, uh, as far as also Maududi is concerned, I think Andrew uh, is really explicit in in arguing that with Maududi, sort of these dialectics between sort of the theocratic element and the popular vice regency, the caliphate of man really enters sort of the bloodstream of Islamist thought as he put it. And then uh, so this continues to that these two aspects have to be reconciled. So I had to think of, um, so just what came to mind when I was reading this was, of course, this famous letter basically that Khomeini sent to Khamenei shortly before his death, which also had to do with the reworking of the Iranian constitution and the establishment of the absolute vice regency yeah. of the Faqih. And yeah. to a certain extent, I wonder whether this is sort of the Iranian answer to precisely this this dilemma, you know, to right. that in on the ground, if you have to put a system like this into action, then you realize that the, you know, the interest of the state really basically has to take a president uh, a precedence over the Sharia because in, yeah. at the end of the day, someone has to call uh, the shots, so to speak. So this yeah. is just one thought that I had, and I wasn't sure what you would make of this, whether you know, the Iranians have reconciled it in this way, the sort of the lofty aspirations to the messy politics on the ground. Yeah. Well, I, I, and, and I think also the, the only reason why that can work is precisely because this kind of faqih uh, can be seen as a legitimate 
um, bearer or wielder of this divine sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that has to be based on this kind of theo theological levels of delegation. So if right. you know, God delegates to the imam and the imam delegates to the faqih, then in a sense, that's fine, you know? Um, mm -hmm. uh, then if the, the faqih decides that that's how the state needs to work, then that's how it needs to work. Um, and and uh, of course, because it's through the state also, then it's using the uh, uh, the branch which is coming out of the representation of the people. So, uh, I mean, it's a particular kind of thing. And but I I, I also wonder, and as Andrew did when we were discussing this, um, uh, whether sovereignty really is the central kind of issue. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot is made of of Hakimiya and place in people like uh, mm -hmm. Odudi, and of course, we know all of these works were translated into Persian mm -hmm. uh, right. you know, by the, the revolutionaries. But I wonder whether uh, anyone's really talking about sovereignty in those ways anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, the question of, of what is being exported, mm -hmm. what is being understood out of the revolution may have, may have shifted now. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. I will, I mean, yeah, this is definitely something also for me to keep in mind when taking this project forward, I guess. Huh? Yeah. But anyway, I mean, this sounds like a, a wonderful project, uh, you know, and uh, and it does need to be done because, I, as I think you you said right at the beginning, and you're absolutely right, mm -hmm. um, the uh, the focus of earlier studies I think has been quite mm -hmm. narrow, um, and even the what we understand by exporting the revolution, people mm -hmm. look at things like, you know, the coup in Bahrain and the bombings in, in Kuwait sure. and right. Hezbollah in in Lebanon, but of course exporting or the global impact of the revolution is, is far, far greater than that. Um, mm -hmm. And some, sometimes it also is reflective of what, you know, now, nowadays we talk about soft power. So, you know, mm -hmm. Iran does have elements of soft power which came out of, of the revolution, which um, mm -hmm. I think people tend to um, really not pay much attention to, but that's quite significant. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a minor element of what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. So um, some of it comes out through the promotion of Iranian culture. You know? Yeah, um, you're totally right. Yeah. Uh, so um, and and the you know the classic you know I, we we've mentioned uh, the conflation of the promotion of Shiism with the revolution, but there's also mm -hmm. the promotion of Iranian culture with the revolution. Right. Uh, it's equally you know the music, uh, the film, the art, uh, mm -hmm. all very much part of it as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, it sounds wonderfully exciting. Uh, Thanks. Thank you, uh, Simon, for this conversation. And um, of course, if people have further questions, etc., uh, we can we can follow them up. Uh, I will make a recording available on the Exeter Institute's um, uh, YouTube channel, uh, so it will be available. And I'm sure either Simon and I would be happy to to take any uh, any kind of comments and questions from you if you want to send them on, on the various uh, platforms that we're active, right. we'd, we'd be happy to engage. Uh, so thank you once again, Simon. Just to uh, mention that we have a number of other uh, conversations coming up this week and tomorrow, which is will be something I think very linked and similar uh, to what we've been discussing, or at least linked, uh, will be my conversation with Carol Kirsten from King's College London about uh, contemporary Islamic thought.